the previous two theorems showed that if you add a rank one matrix, the previous two theorems, meaning the theorem we showed just now, and the last theorem we actually proved in the previous class, um, they showed that if you add a rank one matrix or if you border a Hermitian matrix, then the eigenvalues of the matrix interlace. Okay, so now the question is, if you take two inter interlacing sets of real numbers, then can you, uh, can you realize uh, these interlacing set of real numbers by a Hermitian matrix with a suitable modification, right? So can I find matrices such that these set of interlacing numbers uh, are such that one subset of numbers are uh, the eigenvalues of one matrix. And then if you, uh, for example, border that matrix with a Y and an A, you can get another matrix for which the other set of numbers are um, the eigenvalues. Okay, the answer is yes. And uh, that is what is the essence of the following theorem. So it's kind of a converse result to the theorem we just proved. So let n be a positive integer. And let lambda i, i equal to 1 to n and lambda hat i, i equal to 1 to n plus 1 be two, uh, two given sequences of real numbers. such that they have this interlacing property. So lambda hat one is less than or equal to lambda one, is less than or equal to lambda hat two, lambda two, lambda n minus one, lambda hat n, less than or equal to lambda n, less than or equal to lambda hat n plus one. Now let lambda equals a diagonal matrix with diagonal entries equal to lambda 1 up to lambda n. Then there exists a real number A and y in r to the n. So it's, in fact, it's enough to choose a real vector y such that lambda hat 1 <coughs> up to lambda hat n plus 1 are the eigenvalues of the real symmetric matrix. A hat, which is equal to lambda y, y transpose and a, which is in r to the n plus 1 cross n plus 1. Okay, so that's the statement of the theorem. Okay, so we'll uh, show this. So first of all, uh, note that um, lambda i, i equal to 1 to n are eigenvalues of lambda. So we already have that first property that this matrix here has lambda i as its eigenvalues. And what we are saying now is that the other set of eigenvalues, lambda hat 1, lambda hat 2 up to lambda hat n plus 1, can uh, will be the eigenvalues of this matrix A hat if you choose y and A appropriately. So the proof is essentially going to be constructive. So we'll, we'll show how to choose y and A such that lambda hat 1, lambda hat 2, etc. up to lambda hat n plus 1 are in fact the eigenvalues of A hat. 
so um, straight away what you can do is uh, you can look at trace of a hat and that is equal to trace of lambda plus a and trace of lambda is just the summation of lambda i i going from 1 to n and trace of a hat is the summation of the eigenvalues of a hat and what we want them to be is lambda hat 1 lambda hat 2 up to lambda hat n plus 1 and so this just implies that a is equal to sigma i equal to 1 to n plus 1 um, lambda hat i lambda hat i minus sigma i equal to 1 to n lambda i. So we already figured out what a should be. Okay, now let's look at the characteristic polynomial. Of p a hat of t. So P A hat of T is equal to the determinant of T I. This is an N plus one cross N plus one identity matrix minus A hat, which is equal to just um, substituting for A hat, we can write it as the determinant of the matrix, which has T I minus lambda. This is an N cross N identity matrix and then minus y minus y transpose and t minus a okay now what i can do is i can do one small trick here which is i can pre and post multiply by other matrices whose determinant is one and that will not change the value of this uh, this determinant so that is equal to the determinant of the identity matrix uh, and below that I'll have T I minus lambda inverse times Y transpose zero and a one here. This times this matrix T I minus lambda minus Y minus y transpose t minus a. I'll just draw some partitions here so that the quantities don't get mixed up. And the transpose of this matrix over here, i t i minus lambda inverse y zero and a one here. So these matrices have, uh, these are lower triangular and an upper triangular matrix and their uh, determinant is equal to one. So that doesn't change the value of this determinant. Now, if you carefully multiply these out, what you will find is that um, this reduces to the following form. It becomes determinant of Ti minus lambda. And over here I'll get T minus A minus Y transpose T I minus lambda inverse Y and zero here and a zero here. So that's the reason I did all this so that I get a block diagonal matrix or in fact this is a completely diagonal matrix and since it's a diagonal matrix I can now readily compute its determinant and so that is just equal to the product of the diagonal entries which is this term T minus A minus sigma. So I'll just expand this product here. I equal to 1 to n. Y i squared divided by T minus lambda i. This is a diagonal matrix with lambda i's. Uh, T minus lambda i's are on the diagonal, this inverse of this matrix, because after all, T i minus lambda is diagonal. So T i minus lambda is also a diagonal matrix. So Converting, computing this inverse is uh, super easy. You just invert all the diagonal entries. 
And so that is this, this value. So this is the same as this times the product i equal to 1 to n t minus lambda i. Okay, so we'll call this equation star. We'll come back to it uh, in a bit. So now we have already determined what a is. Okay, and so what we need to do is to find y such that this uh, p a hat of lambda k hat is equal to 0 for k equal to 1, 2 up to n plus 1. Okay, so we have already determined a, so need to find y such that p a hat of lambda k hat equals 0, k equal to 1, 2 up to n plus 1. Okay, so this is a little bit challenging. So let's see how to do that. So consider two functions f of t, which is the product i equal to 1 to n plus 1, t minus t minus lambda hat i. And this is of degree n plus 1. And another polynomial g of t, which is equal to product i equal to 1 to n t minus lambda i. This is of degree. So what we really want is that uh, this, um, this characteristic polynomial should end up becoming and coming out in this form. So that then we know that lambda hat i, i equal to 1 to n plus 1 are the eigenvalues of this. Um, uh, are the zeros of this polynomial. So we basically want to, and this thing here is actually your g of t. Right? And so we have uh, p a hat of t to be this quantity times g of t. And we want that to somehow end up in this form where f of t is equal to product i equal to 1 to n plus 1 t minus lambda hat i. Okay, now this is degree n plus 1. And so this is degree n. So basically what you can do is um, you can, you can write, um, so you can um, you can find um, you can uh, you can divide f of t by g of t, and then you'll get a quotient and a remainder, and the quotient will be of degree one, and the remainder will be of degree at most n minus one. So by um, the Euclidean algorithm. Um, we must have f of t equal to g of t times some t minus c plus r of t, where um, c is some real valued quantity because all the coefficients here are real and r of t must be of degree at most n minus one. So this is the remainder polynomial, and this is the uh, this is the quotient polynomial. So what we can do is uh, now let's um, let's compare um, the coefficients of t power n on both sides. So So the coefficient of t power n plus 1 is just going to be 1 because the t power n plus 1 comes from this t power n here times this t here. But if you look at the coefficient of t power n, the coefficient of t power n here is just the summation of lambda hat i, okay, because you will take n of these terms and one of these lambda hat i's, okay, and uh, or rather it's minus lambda hat i but I'll ignore the minus sign. I'll consider a minus sign for the other thing also. Um, and so the coefficient of t to the n is the summation of lambda hat i, i going from 1 to n plus 1. And if I look at this, the coefficient of t to the n is going to be either I can take all the t terms here, then it will multiply with minus c, 
or I can take n minus one terms here and multiply with this t and then I'll get a minus lambda i. So basically that what that means is that sigma i equal to one to n plus one lambda hat i is equal to c plus sigma i equal to one to n lambda i. And so then this means that c is equal to summation i equal to one to n plus one lambda hat i minus sigma i equal to one to n lambda i, which is actually nothing but a. Okay, and so basically this t minus c that we are looking at here, that's nothing but t minus a. Okay, and further, if I compute f of lambda k, okay, that's going to be equal to g of lambda k times lambda k minus a plus r of lambda k. And this is equal to zero because there is a t minus lambda i term here, product of t minus lambda i terms here. So g of lambda k for any k is equal to zero. And so this is equal to r of k. And this is true for k equal to one, two, up to n. Okay, and so now what that means is that um, if I compute f of lambda k for k equal to one to n, I then know what r of lambda k is uh, at n different points. So, R of t is known at n points. Okay, lambda 1 through lambda n. Okay, so f of lambda k I can compute because it's just this polynomial here. And so I can just substitute lambda one, lambda two, etc. I know what f of lambda k is. And by uh, by this thing, I know then what r of lambda one, lambda two up to lambda n is. So this has a degree at most, uh, r of t has a degree at most n minus one. And I know this, know its value at n different points. And what that really means is that, um, uh, we actually know what R of t is. So just for the moment, uh, in order to proceed further, I'll I'll assume that these uh, lambda 1 to lambda n are distinct. And then I'll come back to the case where some of these eigenvalues are uh, repeated and I'll deal with that case later. So for the moment, assume lambda 1 lambda n are distinct. Okay, then um, uh, then we need we wh what that means is that g of t is the product of all these uh, t minus lambda i terms, and each of these are going to be uh, uh, first order uh, terms. Okay, and so uh, g of t only has simple roots. Each uh, lambda i occurs only once as a root, and uh, so g of t has or only has simple roots and um, we have the following. See, for example, if you are given a uh, first degree polynomial with uh, unknown coefficients, all you need is the value of the polynomial at two points and you can determine what the polynomial is. Similarly, if you are given a second degree polynomial, all you need is the value of the polynomial at three points and you can determine what the polynomial is. And for the first order uh, polynomial case, 
Um, I'm sure you have seen this uh, Lagrange interpolation formula, which tells you how to write out what uh, what that uh, what the straight line that matches the two values that you have observed is. And we see that in linear regression in various problems uh, uh, many times. But this is a generalization of that. So we are looking for an n minus one degree polynomial such that its value matches with some given values, r of lambda one, r of lambda two, up to r of lambda n at n at these n different points. And so that formula is directly, I mean, there's a direct formula to write out what r of t should be. And so this r of t is equal to the summation i equal to one to n, f of lambda i, times g of t divided by g dash of lambda i that is the derivative of g of t evaluated at t equal to lambda i times t minus lambda i. So this is called the Lagrange interpolation formula. Um, so we'll take this on faith, but maybe I can indicate why this is actually correct. So for example, if um, uh, if g of t, if I write g of t to be equal to g i of t times t minus lambda i, so all the other n minus one factors in g of t are in this g i of t, then g dash of t, I can write to be g i dash of t times t minus lambda i plus g i of t. OK, um, which means that if I want to evaluate g dash of lambda i, that is equal to, now, if I substitute lambda i here, I get lambda i minus lambda i. So this term goes off to zero. And so I'll be left with g i of lambda i. OK, so the derivative is actually equal to g i of lambda i. It's a simple fact, but it's true. And so that means that at t equal to some lambda k, if I were to evaluate what happens to this part here, g of t divided by g dash of lambda i times t minus lambda i, what I get is I will get um, either g i of t times, so g of t is g i of t times t minus lambda i, t minus lambda i over g dash of lambda i times t minus lambda i and I need to evaluate this at t equal to so I need to evaluate this as at t equal to lambda k so I'll have to consider the k equal to i and k not equal to i separately so I'll consider k equal to i here and so then I will be substituting t equal to lambda i. And if I substitute t equals lambda i, <coughs> these two terms cancel. And so I'll have g i of lambda i over g i dash of lambda i. But g i dash of lambda i equals g i of lambda i. So this is equal to g i of lambda i over g dash of lambda i, which is equal to 1. So this is for k equal to i. And the other case is um, when k is not equal to i, I won't, I don't need this factorization, so I can just write it as g of lambda k divided by g dash of lambda i times t minus lambda i is lambda k minus lambda i. But g of lambda k is equal to zero for any lambda, right? Because it, all, it has all these factors. g of t is the product of t minus lambda i. So if I 
if I look at G of lambda K, that's always going to be equal to zero. And G dash of lambda I is all the other factors. It's G dash of uh, G I of lambda K. And if I've dropped the I term from G, then this will be a non-zero quantity. And lambda K minus lambda I is also non-zero because I've assumed the eigenvalues are distinct. And so this is always going to be equal to zero for K not equal to I. So then, so now we know what happens to this. So if I, uh, if I, if I look at what happens to R of lambda k, then I'll have a summation i going from one to n, f i f of lambda i times this thing evaluated at t equals lambda k, but this is non-zero only for k equal to i, and so only the uh, the kth term in this summation will survive, and for um, uh, k equals i, this quantity equals 1. And so I'll be just left with f of lambda k. r of lambda k is equal to f of lambda k. Okay, which is what we wanted, right? We started out by saying that f of lambda k is something that's known and we want r of lambda k to equal f of lambda k at these k at these n points lambda 1 lambda 2 up to lambda n so i'll just write that here so r of t is a degree less than or equal to n minus 1 polynomial that satisfies or and put it this way that equals f of lambda k at lambda i i equal to 1 to n i e n distinct points so that means that r of t is actually unique and it is given by the formula that we determine This is a consequence of the Lagrange interpolation. It's a consequence of polynomials. Um, so then what that means is that we now know what the form of R of t is. So if we now consider what f of t divided by g of t is, this is equal to t minus a. So f of t was t minus a g of t plus R of t. So plus R of t divided by g of t is equal to, now I'll use this formula for r of t, which is summation f of lambda i g of t divided by g dash of lambda i times t minus lambda i. So I'll write this as t minus a minus summation i equal to 1 to n. Um, Okay, I wrote it with a minus, so I have to write a minus f of lambda i over g dash of lambda i times 1 over t minus lambda i. Sir? Yes? Uh, sir, in uh, the above point, the one above rt is uniquely determined, uh, hmm. should it be f of lambda k or f of lambda i? It is um, at, okay, so let me, to avoid confusion, I'll just remove this. So at n distinct points, okay? All I'm trying to say is that R of T matches uh, certain given values at n distinct points. Happy? Is it clear? 
No, sir. Uh, I'll think about it, sir. I'll ask on Teams. Yeah, so basically R of T is some polynomial. We don't know what it is, but we know that R of lambda k equals F of lambda k at k uh, lambda 1 uh, at k equal to for k equal to 1 to n. That is all that I'm saying. It's a degree n minus 1 polynomial up to uh, at most n minus 1 polynomial where its value at n distinct points is completely determined. So for example, if I have the real line and I gave you one, two, three points and I say here is one value, here is another value and here is another value. Now if I asked you to fit a, a degree two polynomial, okay, which is a quadratic, which matches with these, then um, it turns out that there is only one way you can do that, which is a quadratic that somehow looks a bit like this. I'm not good at drawing these things, but um, it's a quadratic that looks like this. There's no other way you can fit a quadratic that matches these three points. At least. If you had given me, uh, if you had allowed me to choose a, a third order polynomial, then it you can actually choose many different third order polynomials where it matches with these three values. But if I have to choose a quadratic, this is the only way to do it. It's easier to think of it if you go to an even more trivial case, which is a, a straight line. So um, if you give me two points and then you say the value here is this and the value here is this, then there is only one way I can fit a straight line through both these points. Okay, and this is a first order polynomial. And if you allow me to fit a quadratic through these, I can I can fit many different quadratics. This is in fact a quadratic where the uh, the t squared coefficient equals zero. But of course, I can fit a quadratic maybe like this, maybe like this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are many ways to fit a quadratic through this, but there's only one way to fit a straight line where it meets these two points. So if you take, uh, uh, if you are given that a polynomial is of degree at most n minus one, and if you specify its value at n distinct points, then the polynomial is completely determined. I'm just illustrating that the way we've uh, chosen R of t by using this Lagrange interpolation formula is such that it's uh, R of lambda, uh, lambda k equals f of lambda k for Lambda k, lambda one, lambda for, or for k equal to one, two up to n. Okay, oh, so I'm not, yeah, I'm not shown the uniqueness here. That's a property of uh, polynomials, but I'm just saying that the way we've chosen is actually something that works in the sense that it matches f of lambda k, uh, r of lambda k matches f of lambda k for k going from one to n. I hope that's a bit clearer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So um, now, Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, be, uh, so we, uh, we need to determine a polynomial uh, of degree at most n minus one. That was R T, and mm -hmm. uh, we we know the value at n minus one points. N uh, points. N points here. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, we could uh, write it uh, in terms of general polynomial expression and uh, and uh, we know the different values. So basically the coefficients are unknown. So we could yes. uh, express it in AX equal to be linear set of equations and we could yes. solve it. Absolutely. Yes, that also works. This is a direct formula for the for the answer. Okay. If you did that, this is the answer you would get. Okay. okay. This Lagrange interpolation formula is the answer you would get if you did what you what you just suggested. Okay, uh, sir, uh, another side question that uh, that you told that uh, if I am given two points and uh, then I can uh, fit uh, infinite number of uh, quadratics through them. Mm -hmm. So if I uh, in this way, if I form the set linear uh, set of linear equations, then uh, I'll find some uh, some vector in the null space. Uh, that is yeah. the inter interpretation in, in this. Absolutely. So there's a very nice connection between polynomials and linear systems of equations. And uh, yeah, so what you said is actually correct. Number of solutions if there is something in null space. Yes. So. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, maybe um, 
time permitting i'll uh, take a digression and discuss uh, this uh, this kind of connections also but uh, we are actually closing in on the end of this course and so there is some more material that i need to cover uh, let's see how it goes uh, but your intuition is correct uh, now um, coming back to this uh, so what do we want we want that f of lambda k hat equals 0 for k equal to 1 2 up to n plus 1 okay so to oops to have f of lambda hat k equal to 0 k equal to 1 2 up to n plus 1 we must have Now substituting directly into this formula here, lambda hat k minus a minus sigma i equal to 1 to n minus f of lambda i divided by g dash of lambda i times 1 over lambda hat k minus lambda i equal to 0 for k equal to 1, 2, up to n plus 1. Okay, now um, now uh, one uh, one small point is that what if, I mean, I'm, I'm dividing by lambda hat k minus lambda i, and so if lambda hat k equals one of these lambda i's, then of course I'm dividing by 0, that doesn't make sense. So this is not a problem because if lambda hat k equals lambda i, then I have f of lambda i sitting here, okay? And so this coefficient will also be equal to zero because f of lambda hat k and lambda hat k equals lambda i. So f of lambda hat k equals zero. So these two actually first cancel and then you have one over g dash of lambda i. So it, there's no singularity at t equal to uh, lambda hat k. Okay, so now um, what we'll do is we will set um, y i squared to be equal to minus f of lambda i over g dash of lambda i. And uh, this is for i equal to 1, 2, up to n. Now, if we can show that this why uh, this quantity is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, then um, and now I'm telling you how to choose y i. Okay, then um, okay, so then let's see. If I go, oops, let me go up here. Yeah, so P A hat of T is equal to T minus A divided by, sorry, minus Y I squared over T minus lambda I times this product, okay? So now let's compare this, okay, against, um, so you'll need to keep this in mind or maybe what I'll do is I'll write that here so that it will be clear. P A hat of t is equal to t minus a minus sigma i equal to 1 to n y i squared over t minus lambda i times the product i equal to 1 to n t minus lambda i. Okay, this is what we had earlier. And um, and what we have here is that f of t over g of t 
is equal to t minus a minus sigma i equal to 1 to n f of minus f of lambda i over g dash of lambda i times 1 over t minus lambda i and g of t is exactly this polynomial here. Now f of t is something that we are choosing such that it has lambda hat 1 through lambda hat n plus 1 as its zeros. And so if this polynomial exactly matches with this polynomial, we know that a hat, the characteristic polynomial of a hat has lambda hat 1 through lambda hat n as its zeros. So if you look at this, this g of t is exactly this thing here. And so all you need is to make this equal to this and then you are home dry in the sense that these are exactly the same polynomials. Okay, so all you need now is to show that yi squared, uh, if, for, for me to be able to define this to be yi squared, this quantity should be non-negative. Then I can define this to be yi squared for some real valued quantity yi. And so if I can show that, um, so if we can show that yi squared, or actually I'll put it this way, minus f of lambda i over g dash of lambda i is greater than or equal to 0 for i equal to 1 through n, then p a hat of lambda hat k equals 0 for k equal to 1 through n plus 1 from this equation star, which is the same as this. Okay, so that means that we have found uh, the polynomial that we want. I mean, we found the y such that the characteristic polynomial of a hat is exactly the one that has lambda hat 1 up to lambda hat n as its roots. Okay, so now I still need to show that these yi squares are greater than or equal to 0 or that... Um, f of lambda i over g dash of lambda i is less than or equal to zero. So um, that's just one or two more steps, but I'll do that uh, in the next class because I've run out of time. Um, and then I need to extend this to the case where the eigenvalues could be repeated because I assumed that lambda one, lambda two up to lambda n are distinct. Um, the extension is going to turn out to be almost trivial because if, uh, for example, lambda 1 equals lambda 2, then lambda 2 hat equals lambda 1 because lambda 2 hat is supposed to interlace between lambda 1 and lambda 2. And so that means that I can uh, pull out some factors and uh, deal with them separately and then consider only the distinct eigenvalues that remain. Okay, so we'll complete this proof in the next class. We'll stop here for today.